Israel, my colleague, third talk for the day. <laughs> Probably doesn't need much of an introduction, so I'm going to start with uh, Bupinder, who is a customer engineer. And I think we can have the session on design consideration to operate a stateful streaming pipelines as a service. Good. So we're going to be talking about how to operate pipelines as a service. Okay. So because the streaming pipelines are services and what are the design implications for, for the pipeline itself uh, when you want to operate it as a service. So today we will be talking about a problem with some context and about design principles to apply for your pipeline to let's say to avoid problems and to be able to operate it in the most reliable way with, with an example solution and some let's say principles on on specifically on how to do this on google cloud in particular so streaming is complex um, streaming is complex and streaming pipelines are services your users have expectations about your pipeline. They expect your data to be ready at some moment. They expect your data to be correct. They expect, uh, they have exp um, performance expectations about the latency. And observing your streaming pipeline is also a complex thing. I, for instance, uh, find uh, in, in the field with customers very often that customers are trying to use simple approaches to know if they are meeting these expectations for instance setting thresholds and alerting when these thresholds are not met like latency with the thresholds for instance when you do this so you're gonna have lots of let's say false positives okay so lots of alerts that are not so relevant and you're gonna have this alert fatigue in this talk we want to talk about how to operate this as a service because this is a situation that we have already seen very often uh, like uh, for decades already like in the internet when we are operating uh, services in the web or microservices it's exactly the same principle so let's let's go into the problem itself so here we are gonna be sorting data and streaming so this sounds familiar so well it's always the same problem but the different different perspective so we are getting here uh, taxi ride events in a streaming uh, because it's a streaming so we don't know where are the boundaries of the data because it's a streaming so we cannot guarantee that data is in order and here we have different keys represented as different colors and we want to be able to recover from this data that is coming without boundaries that is coming continuously that is coming out of order we want to be able to recover the sessions of our user this is the pipeline as a service that we're going to be operating. We're not going to enter into lots of details on how to do this. Like this is like the problem statement. So we're going to be talking about how to operate this. We will discuss a little bit about the implementations because there are implications for the operations, but we're not going to enter into full details. There's a repository with a running example with full details if you want to have the full code, but we will not cover those this. So how do we design a pipeline like this to work reliably? well now here so well this is not new etl so extract transform load you have to apply this pattern also in streaming so so what is this pattern in streaming what does this mean your pipeline is interacting with the world it's receiving data from the world and it has to impact the world okay um, and everything else that is happening in the middle so to speak has to be idempotent that's the summary of the talk here today we are getting input into the pipeline so this cannot be idempotent no so every time we are doing this we will see something new hopefully no new data so this is this is having side effects and every time we go and write something to like the to the world so we're also having some kind of side effects and this is fine and this is how it should be okay because well so our pipeline has to produce data and has to read data but everything else it shouldn't have any kind of side effect and this is really important in streaming because if we apply this pattern performance is going to be good we are going to be able to measure the any kind of metric in our uh, pipeline and we're going to be able to produce um, uh, these metrics and to, to produce uh, the output of the pipeline with performance scalability blah blah so here what we do in the middle so if we design our pipelines to so all the side effects to be let's say um, stuck in the beginning and in the end of the pipeline in the edges in the edges of the pipeline and everything that's in the middle any kind of interaction with the outside world is limited to enriching or hydrating uh, your data read only 
uh, transformations, uh, you're pulling the data, if you pull it twice, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, the correctness is not affected because it's read only. Or if you are, let's say, brave enough, I, I was going to say clever, but I, would, I, uh, I prefer to say brave, if you manage to do this in a impotent way, and there are ways to do that, there are also talks about this in, in the mean summit today, well, so that's also fine. Anything that is non-idempotent and is related on any kind of external state, no go, okay? So that is not gonna work in, in, in the generic case, okay? So, so this is the design principle we're gonna, we're gonna be applying today here in our pipeline, and this is the assumptions we're gonna make for the rest of the talk on how to operate our pipeline. You may be wondering now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer probably one of the questions that the, uh, you may make at the end, like, uh, so well, so but, but things are have side effects, and for sure, okay? So remember, but things should happen at the end of the pipeline, remember, at one of the edges, okay? And uh, you can design a sink and a source in ways that are ensure that your processing is ha happening exactly once, okay? Not only once, it means that if you have repetitions, you don't have inconsistency in, in your data. There was a very interesting talk yesterday about uh, how to write an I.O. for BIN, where these things are discussed, okay? So you can do this in, in, in BIN. You just shouldn't be doing this in the middle of your pipeline estimate. Okay, so now back to you, Bupi. So let's talk about our sample solution. Let's talk a little bit about how we implemented this. Sure. Thanks, Israel. Um, so Beam offers state and timers API. Uh, so state API offers the ability to manage the state per key, and that allows us to have a fine-grained control over the aggregations. And the timer API offers the ability to have per key timer callback APIs that we can set up on the event timestamp or on the processing time timestamp. And the value we get from there is that we can do a delayed processing of the data that's stored in the state API. So we are using these primitives for our example. So let me walk you through this schematic. So if you look at the center, we have this blue box that represents our DoFM, which has a process element inside it. And the input to the DoFM is the taxi ride events, which you can see on the top marked in step one and depicted as a yellow squares. Um, so, so we are depicting just one key in this example, but the DoFM will process the same workflow for all the keys in the input payload. So for example, we are taking the taxi ride events and we are using the key as a ride ID, which is into the input payload. But for more realistic example, it could be a taxi ID if you are getting events from multiple taxis and you're generating a session out of it. So as these events come into the DoFM, we store it into a state and we are using two states of bag and combining value. Bag state is being used to store these or accumulate these taxi ride events in an unordered set of elements. And combining value state we are using to keep track of the maximum timestamp that we have seen for the ride events in a particular key. And as we are storing this data in step two in the state, we are also inspecting the event because we are looking for a specific event type, which is a ride status as a drop off. And when we notice that, we read the elements back from the bag, we call our business processing function to calculate the session, and then we emit that session into a step four depicted as a yellow circles. And when we don't see our specific event type, we, what we do is we basically go and set the timer which is just to keep track of the inactive ride events for a particular key. And that's getting invoked in step three on the left. And when the timer gets invoked, we follow the same business logic that we did to calculate the session in step two, but now reading the bags in the timer and then also clearing the uh, keys for the inactive rides. So that's the high level flow of the um, these logic that we are using for our example solutions here. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the, the, the question can come up like why we can't use the windows. Um, we all know that Beam, Windows, and Triggers offer this powerful abstraction to, for grouping and aggregations on this unbounded stream of data. But that works mostly when we have like temporal properties that we are trying to create these aggregations on. In this example, as we are working on a specific data attribute of the input payload, state and timers becomes a better fit because it gives us an additional control on top of it. And in any case, for SRE principles, we are also producing some custom metrics 
Um, so for SLO monitoring, the best one is to use a distribution metric because it can help us to identify if our metric, metric is deviating much from a good value or not. So we are using that as an example in this. And we are also using uh, counter metrics, which are not so great for the SLO, but it's good to keep track of the number of actions in our DoFN. And we'll walk through these in the next couple of slides. So this is our DAG representation of the pipelines. So on the left side, you can see we have on the top message reading from the PubSub, and then we're converting into our taxi ride event uh, uh, class with the event timestamp, and then we are branching up into a left and right section. On the left side, we are reading the row, uh, we are writing the row events into a BigQuery table. And on the right side, we are creating the key and then passing it to the generate session DoFN that we talked to the schematic slide earlier, and then passing it back to our, our sessions table. On the right side also is the same view, but in a different execution step view. At the bottom, you can see the counters that I was talking about. So we are we are tracking how many ride events we are receiving, how many being processed, and how many sessions being processed. And the code is also available on the GitHub link that you see here to reproduce the, the example illustration we are talking about. So this, this is an example view of the input payload. So um, there are a couple of attributes here, but the one that I want to highlight here is the ride ID section. This is the one that we are using for key. And as I alluded earlier, for more realistic example, it could be a taxi ID. Um, and then we are using the timestamp that you see here as the event time, because we are setting the timers on top of the event timestamps. And then we are using the ride status where you can see the end route and drop off. This is where we are actually inspecting the payload and creating the sessions based on a certain specific ride status. And this is how an output looks like. So now we are taking those bunch of row events and creating a session. So you can see we are uniquely identifying a session. We are seeing how much of a meter reading has been done per session, how much of the uh, duration has been for that session, and what is the reason we are creating the session. So you can see there are two reasons here. One is the drop-off, and the second is garbage collection. If you go back to the schematic we talked about, the drop-off is coming from the step two, and the garbage collection is coming from the step three. Um, this is a quick code snippet of walking through the same logic that we talked about. So here we are looking at the process function in our DoFN. And a couple of things to note here, in addition to the element and the element timestamp, we are also passing two state parameters. One is the bag state for the taxi ride events. And also the another one is the combining value state for the max timestamp scene. And we are also passing GC timer, which is a timer set on the event timestamp. And as you can see in the code, we are adding the events into the bag. We are updating the max timestamp, and then we are incrementing the counter and then checking the status. If it is drop off, we are calling a function with passing the bag and the reason. And that basically going to calculate our business logic to generate a session. And then we again go and update our counter for session process. And then we uh, yield the output with the particular timestamp. We also make sure that we are clearing the state because we don't want the state to be lingering around. And if it is not drop off, as I mentioned in the schematic uh, slide, we are setting up the timer. And here we are just setting up a timer as five minutes, but you can set it based on your business requirement to keep track of the inactive keys. And once the timer gets invoked, uh, we basically follow the same business logic. We are calling the same function, but now we are passing a different reason for calculating the session. And then we are clearing the state at the end of that. Um, this is the example of a business related SLI. So we already talked about the counter metric. So this is a distribution metric. Um, so here you can see in our DoFN, we are initializing the distribution metric. Uh, we, are, we are taking an example of vehicle speed. And on the bottom, you see, this is how we are calculating in our business logic function that we are using to calculate session. And we are updating that distribution metric with the session speed. So every session we, we are calculating the vehicle speed here. So that was a quick overview of the example implementation, and I'll pass it back to Israel to talk about some of the operating principles now. Thanks, Bupi. So, so in our streaming pipeline, we have different kinds of metrics. So we have uh, watermark related metrics like lattices, uh, processing lattices, data freshness, and these kind of things. We have the counters, and we have seen also custom metrics, business related metrics. So these are really important for us to be able to operate a pipeline as a service because 
our users are going to have expectations about latency, performance, correctness, but also are going to have expectations that cannot be measured in out-of-the-box metrics. They have to be measured in business-related metrics, like this average speed for our taxis, okay? So the, um, we need to be able to produce SLIs, service-level indicators for our pipelines using metrics, custom metrics in the case of, of Apache Bean. And the first step that we should be doing in our design before we write code is setting a service level objective, okay? But for this, we need to have identified uh, service level indicators. So typically, this will be things that we identify, let's say, with business stakeholders. So what is important about our pipeline and, and also what is possible to measure inside the pipeline because, uh, well, we will not have, we have the information that we have inside. And then we, with this, is how we commit to providing a certain level of service with the data that we have, with the constraints that we have. And once we set this, we will determine automatically an error budget. So how often we can fail, okay? And is hand the handling of this error budget, the management of this error budget, how we operate the service, okay? And if we do this, so we will be doing a smarter reaction to bad events. Let, let's have a look at some, some of these uh, some examples. Like for instance, this is one of, this is a view of the services uh, module of cloud monitoring. So you can implement this probably in many different systems. So we did it in cloud monitoring because we, that's what we had at hand. So here we have defined a couple of SLOs, like processing latency, the time that it takes to process data. And we put a limit of 90 seconds. We were not really very uh, ambitious here, but wherever or the uh, writing the latency to be query or the age of the data. So whatever metric you can produce. So when you define an SLA and a service level indicator, you also define a level and a threshold, okay? For instance, we have defined a threshold of 90 seconds and 95% of the time, we want to be able to um, process the data in less than 90 seconds. It's one of the sessions of a, of a taxi. When we do that, when we put the service level indicator, so by doing, by setting this level of 95% or whatever, we're actually setting an error budget. If it's 95%, for instance, on a window of a month, it means that for 5% of my month, I can tolerate not meeting this level of 90 seconds. Um, if, I'm, if I go beyond the 5% of a month, like, a, like, a, like three days or whatever, or no, 1.5 days, like a couple of days, then, then well, so I will be out of a, of a error budget and I should do something, okay, if, to the extent that is possible. So for instance, here we see um, our service level indicator for processing latency uh, over the span of uh, one day. And we see that, well, sometimes we didn't meet this, okay? Like for instance, here, our processing latency was uh, 0% instead of uh, 100%. And we have put the limit of 97, not 95, 97%. Here we also uh, violated our threshold, and here, and here, and here. But we didn't bother any of our engineers that were on call when this happened, OK? Because, well, we still have some budget. Not a lot remaining, so maybe it's time to start bringing uh, some people, OK? So, so they have a look. But we didn't do that, that here. We did it, let's say, after a while, OK? And then so we don't have to pay extra time for the on-call engineers, okay? Because we don't bother them with things that, let's say, don't, don't require uh, their intervention. So compare this to reacting to every single violation of the threshold, okay? So when you are here and then everything is fine, it's like, well, so it's an alert that sounds all the time. And so it's an alert that doesn't work because you don't really pay attention to it. So this is another another indicator here, for instance. So here is this big query session write latency. Here we put the level of 95%. And here the situation is a little bit worse. Again, so we violated this, uh, this indicator more frequently. We're almost out of budget, okay? So now we should, we should be reacting, okay? So is this handling of the budget what uh, um, um, allows us to be able to uh, assign people to uh, reactions to interventions more, more smartly. And also to be able to know what we, are, we, what we can commit to, okay? So for instance, so here we see that our error budget was down, okay, for, for a while, but then it started to increase and recover, okay? Maybe when we were here, we were freaking out, okay? But then 
when we were around here and we saw that the trend is positive, okay, so we can already, let's say, like stop the fire and, 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 go, and go back to sleep and let's say, and, and breathe uh, without a, a worry because things are recovering, okay? So, and then, so we, we know that, well, even in the case of, in the worst case of the, uh, of a running out of, uh, of budget, so we can react quickly to this, and whatever we have defined in this service level indicator, the percentage of, a, of a tolerance uh, for, for, for the violation of the threshold, uh, the, the threshold itself, it's something that we can commit to, and it's something that we can offer our customers, okay? So we can process this data 95% of the time, or in less than 90 seconds, whatever, okay? And if we have a situation like this, okay, well, so this is not so good, okay? So we saw here that this is a different indicator, so we had an incident, it recovered much more slowly, okay? Then another incident is also, let's say, it's recovering very, 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 very slowly, okay? So maybe here in the definition of this SLI, we should be, we should be less uh, ambitious, okay? Because it, this is not something we can commit to, okay? And well, here is assumed for like to see that this is really recovering very slowly. So almost done, remember this principle. So streaming is unforgiving, um, okay? So it's not the same as running in batch. It's not just getting your code and put it in, in, batch, in the streaming from batch. That's a very nice feature that we have from BIM, but then we have to think about something else, okay? So we have to think about the user expectations of, an, of our pipeline, and we need to be able to react to those expectations. So we need to operate our pipelines as services, okay? The expectations are gonna be about correctness, quality, performance, latency, whatever, and we shouldn't be reacting to every alert, okay? So we shouldn't be setting naive alerts for our pipelines, okay? Or we're, or we're gonna be really like bothered all the time by alerts that are uh, totally irrelevant, okay? So applying SRA principles to streaming pipelines allow us to be able to react when we need to react and be able to find out what we can commit to with our customers about the level of expectations of performance and other metrics of our pipelines. So this is it. Thanks everyone. So here you have the link to the example with um, with all the with all the code. And if you run this in Dataflow, so you should be able to get the same kind of metrics and replicate some of the dashboards that we have shown here.